Hi everyone, welcome to MTS's Recovery Road webinar series. I'm your host, Kat Shaw, the Director of Marketing and Content for Mountain Travel Symposium. Today we're going to sit down with DMOs in Canada, the US, and Switzerland to hear all about their reopening strategies and, and what the, that's been like in their destination. So for those of you who have joined us before, this is a little bit different than our format that we've had in the past. I'll be doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with our destination leaders. And then after those interviews are done, we'll bring everybody back uh, on stage, so to speak, to uh, have a little bit of a Q and A. So uh, just make sure that you submit your questions through the Q&A feature and not the chat feature. We'll be monitoring the Q&A to, to, to answer your questions. And as in the past, we have a survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. Please complete that survey for us. It is super important so that we can get your feedback and uh, continue, continue to create some great, great programming. So um, with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists for today. We have Karen Goodwin, the VP of Destination and Marketing Development for Tourism Whistler, Bruno Hugler, the Director of Cron Montana Tourism and Congress, Andrew Siegwart, the President of Blue Mountain Village Association, and John Erty, the, direct, the Executive Director of Mammoth Lakes Tourism. So with that, I would like to invite Karen Goodwin to join me. Hello. Uh, hello, and I'm just going to stop sharing my screen here. Second. Oh. Okay. <laughs> hello, Karen, sorry about Hi. that. Hi. So, uh, so welcome. So I would like you to start out by giving our audience a little bit of um, some insight on what happened in Whistler and kind of what, what Whistler has looked like for the past three to four months from shutting down to reopening. Sure. So Whistler uh, closed in, in mid-March, like most other uh, places, and it took about a week for most of our visitors to leave. Um, our province didn't have a, a shelter in place or stay at home order. It was more, the onus was on individuals. There was a non-essential travel ban. So we weren't to go anywhere. Restaurants were closed. You could get takeout, you know, no hair salons, that sort of thing. We also had um, um, no mass gatherings over 50 um, people. So that has really impacted our meetings and events business. And that's for the remainder of the year. Um, we have an, a very strong leadership from our government. We have this incredible um, public health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry, she's very calm and very uh, experienced and confident. She's been an incredible leader. Um, we have flattened the curve. We've had just over 2,900 cases and just over 180 deaths in total in the whole time. So we have definitely um, done very well. We entered into phase two in mid-May, a bit more opened up and it wasn't until June 23rd in um, that we were given the okay, lifted the travel ban, we could start marketing and open the resort. So that happened a couple weeks ago. Um, we certainly have seen some pent up demand from our regional market. Uh, we're reaching sort of 70, 80% occupancy on weekends, but it definitely spikes on the weekends and then goes back down to 20 to 30% midweek. Um, so definitely don't have that good uh, long stay business from international and, and meetings business throughout the midweek period. Uh, so yeah, that's a concern. We won't get to phase four um, opening borders and allowing those meetings and events to take place again until there's a vaccine or um, a treatment. So we don't foresee that into the end of the year or beginning of 2021 at the earliest, unfortunately. Thanks, okay, so now our, our audience understands a little bit about where Whistler was coming from in this whole situation. So can you tell me, during the process and to get to uh, the reopening phase that you're at, what were three of the key elements that were most important that, that you would definitely employ those tactics again? So yeah, so we, um, we started right off the get-go of having a weekly call with our stakeholders. 
um, our members, so our hotels, uh, restaurant shops, activities, uh, and showing strong leadership in communicating um, to that audience. Uh, things were changing quickly, so keeping them updated. We were also attending our provincial tourism, um, Destination BC's calls, Destination Canada's calls, and feeding them that, that information. So we kept a lot of alignment there. Um, we included forecast scenarios. What would it look like for the best case scenario for recovery, the, you know, the more likely case and the worst case and what that looked like for traveler numbers and who was coming. Um, we informed them on all those cancellations. So when conference business canceled, all those events canceled, all that summer business from the US and international canceled, we informed them what that would look like, but also the percentage that would rebook into 2021. It gave us an opportunity to talk through important things like how important a flexible cancellation policy was to give our customer con confidence to take their booking from this summer and rebook it to next summer and keep it on the books, at least for future. So um, a lot of those things happened. We were also able to um, talk to all our hotels and say, okay, when are you reopening at what capacity? And then look at the restaurant sector. What capacity are you gonna have? And we quickly realized we didn't have enough seats in restaurants to feed all the people that would be in the hotels. So we've upped the communication on takeout options and are there outdoor dining spaces for for those people too, so we can get everyone fed <laughs> in the resort, um, pretty important. So uh, yeah, that sort of uh, was one thing that was really important is that communication piece. And we've had good feedback from our members that that was something really good. Um, probably the most important thing that um, we've done, we've got a great research team here at, at uh, Tourism Whistler, and we've got a research panel that we put together a couple years ago so it's 6,000 people in a database that have agreed to let us survey them and, and ask them questions. Most of them are, are past travelers, visitors to the resort, but there's also about 500 uh, locals, community members. Um, so really good tool uh, to be able to measure the sentiment of what they're feeling and, and what's going on. So we were able to ask them things like um, measure their travel intentions. How are they feeling about COVID and how is this gonna impact their future travel intentions? And out of that, um, definitely the visitor was telling us, you know, we want to know what to expect when we come, what are the COVID protocols in place and do, are we gonna feel welcome? Uh, and then our locals wanted to make sure that those people visiting were gonna be respectful and keep their social distancing measures in place and, and wearing masks where appropriate and all those good things. And then the businesses wanted to have an idea of um, what could they expect with travel volume. So it, it certainly helped um, uh, being able to survey them and share this collective uh, information back with them. But one great tool that came out of all that um, was uh, we created a doors open directory. So being able to um, show what businesses were open, their hours, what their safety protocols were, um, how to make a reservation at a restaurant, all that good information, um, you know, was in one place and that uh, it was searchable, filterable. You could find all the takeout restaurants or the, you know, different options for dining or what activities were available and what that looked like. So it was about helping people plan um, before they go and, and arrive here. So some, some good tools and, and good learnings from all ah. that reopening. I think that's really great for our audience to take away if you if you don't already have a, a group uh, to survey and you're not already employing that tactic that's definitely something to look into um, building and, and yeah. so that, that doors open directory that that you mentioned Karen if anyone wanted to uh, take a look at that where could they find that oh yeah on um, whistler.com slash summer it's on there it's a it's definitely a helpful tool and it again not only our visitors, but our, our uh, locals are using that to, to find what's open and uh, the hours of operation because they are varying because it's summer and there isn't as much business. So there might not be open every day of the week or the regular hours that you'd expect. Yeah, no, that's very important. I, I know I know in my, my own city, I wasn't sure where I could get takeout from. So for a while, I just like didn't get takeout because I didn't know <laughs> who was open and how, how to get it, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah. So no, I'd be wandering in the village and people are going, I don't know what's open. So yeah. it's certainly, we've got signage up and, and messaging it as much as we can. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a really great uh, marketing piece. So what are some of the other uh, marketing tactics that, that you've employed in, in the reopening phase? Well, um, 
you know, along with our campaign, which um, we've evolved from last year called Adventure Differently, we've, we've built in a, a really good responsible tourism message. I mean, this is something that we talked about in the past, but we've never gotten around to. But now more than ever, it's, uh, it's super important. And it's, it's just highlighting some of the, the behaviors that you want to expect from your visitor. So, you know, what we're asking of everyone, our visitor and our local. So it's around, um, let's interact considerately. Um, let's play simply. Let's not go all hog wild and fill the, the clinic with broken bones from the mountain bike park. Um, let's explore responsibly um, and let's enjoy patiently. I think patience is one of those key things. There's going to be lineups and you're going to have to be patient and the experience might not be what you it was the last time you were here, but um, you know, it, it's a new thing and we're just trying to educate you on that and but you got to be patient and all that. So um, so some of that responsible tourism messaging, as well dispersion, um, you know, super important in, in destin mountain destinations. We, we love our village settings and it's a place to gather, but we need to get people out exploring. So um, we've got some self-guided walking tours. We're encouraging people to explore 40 kilometers of valley trail and lakes. Um, we've got um, animation that just sort of breadcrumbs that lead you out of the village because there's someone performing. Um, just a surprise and delight thing that just carries you a bit outside the, the core of the village. So, um, and then length of stay, like I mentioned earlier, we're seeing spikes on the weekend because it's the regional market. Um, that regional market will go for a week to the interior of BC or to the island. They've always thought of Whistler as a weekend or long weekend. We're trying to give them ways to extend their stay, try something new, um, even a, you know, make Whistler your home and work here for two weeks and the kids can play um, because you can do that. So giving some ideas to, to drive that longer length of stay. And I, I think that that's great, that length of stay. We've talked about that on one of our other webinars is increased length of stay being a great opportunity for destinations. Um, what, what are you seeing with the makeup of the travelers who are coming to Whistler? I know the US border is closed. Have you had any, any issues with that? Yeah, it's been in the news a bit lately <laughs> um, of people um, coming across the border saying that they're driving to Alaska and they won't stop and they do. <laughs> um, it's not huge numbers. Um, it is, you know, our border is closed to non-essential travel. There is a requirement to, to quarantine for 14 days, but the messaging that we're putting out there is you don't know everyone's story. Um, our health officer has told us that the majority of American license plates that you're seeing are actually Canadians returning home from the states. Um, so, you know, be kind, educate, um, <laughs> and, um, you know, don't, don't plate shame. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're, don't we're, plate we're not in charge of the border. So, um, I haven't, yeah. I haven't heard that one yet. Don't plate shaming. Oh, plate shame. shaming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. Um, but you have to trust that your, your protocols, the safety protocols you put in place are working. So it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, well, thanks, Karen. Uh, time's up. So I'm going to say goodbye to you and we'll, we'll see you back uh, for Q&A. Okay. Thanks so much. And with that, I'd like to welcome John Erty uh, from Mammoth Lakes Tourism. Good morning. Hey, John. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So uh, why don't you give us the lowdown on, on what happened in Mammoth? Yeah, Mammoth Lakes is a, an interesting uh, case study here because obviously we had the same challenge as everyone else. March uh, 13th, the ski area closed, um, third most visited ski, re ski resort in the country uh, in during our peak time and really just kind of put us into a, a little bit of a frenzy because we're a small four square mile town of 8,000 year round residents and we really had to spring into action to discourage visitation. And I've been in this tourism and hospitality world for about 35 years. And uh, to, to have to put out a message that asked people not to come was probably the most difficult thing I've ever done in my career. Um, but we had to, I think in the grand scheme of things, while we're a massive destination in the summertime with Eastern Gateway to Yosemite National Park, uh, our hospital has, at the time, we had capacity for 17 beds and four ventilators, and we could not deal with a, uh, a spike in cases here. On a busy weekend, our 8,000, uh, town of 8,000 people spikes up to about 40,000 people coming in, mainly from Southern California. And as I think a lot of people will know that Los Angeles has been 
uh, pretty high in the count on COVID. And I think that's, um, that was one of our biggest fears. So really our goal was to protect the community um, because of the fact that we just didn't have the resources that we would need to handle a, a large number of cases. Uh, as it is right now, we've actually, for us, we've had a spike this week. We've had eight new cases this week, uh, probably stemming from the traffic came in, coming in from 4th of July. Um, but we're only at a total of 48 cases and we've had unfortunately one fatality. Um, but most of the cases that have come to ICU level have been sent out either to Carson City, Reno, or down to Los Angeles for help. So it's, uh, it's been tough. And with a town of, um, that lives and dies on tourism, we have no manufacturing, we have no technology, we have no agriculture. You know, when you shut down the entire operation, it's a major, major hit. And at this point, we've probably lost a half a dozen businesses permanently. Um, you know, depending on where we go in the next six months, that number will likely go up. Um, typically, we're fairly busy in July and August, September, and then October, November, early December, we're fairly slow until ski season starts. So not unlike uh, many destinations around the country and around the world. And so this July and August timeframe is where people really need to make some money, but we need to be safe about it as well. So, so how are you managing that, uh, being safe about welcoming visitors back and making sure that the, the community is, is comfortable with that, that huge drive market that, that you mentioned that you have? Yeah, again, I mean, we have probably 38 million people within five hours of us. So it's a, it's a big challenge and they're all coming from hotbeds of, of COVID, whether it's, um, you know, Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a major challenge. So the biggest thing we had to do is make sure that, that locally that we were ready to go, um, that all of our businesses were prepared to follow all the guidelines. And we have a, a, we work very closely with our county. We have a hashtag out there, stay safe to stay open. And really it's, it's, it's geared towards our visitors, but it's also geared towards our, our businesses. And we've had a few businesses that um, have had challenges with different things. And I, I think that getting them all to wear their masks, getting them to social distance, their tables, getting all those different pieces in place from a, a business standpoint is one thing, but then there are challenges with people that come in that don't want to wear masks and are very belligerent about it. And it's really become, um, you know, a, a battle cry for some that they're not going to wear a mask. And so working with our businesses, the whole stay safe to stay open campaign is, is really geared towards the idea that you can turn one customer away right now and lose that business, or you can let them in and we have a problem and you're closed for the next four months again. You know, being closed here for three months, tourism related industry, we were probably floating around 80% unemployment. And, and it was really, really difficult for people. So I don't think anybody wants to go back to that. So as much as people think that there's a, um, uh, you know, sale to be made. I think the bigger picture is the one that we need to be looking at. Uh, a friend who owns a restaurant in town here posted the other day that she turned away a table of eight uh, because they refused to wear their masks. And, you know, eight people in restaurants, a fair amount of uh, revenue that she turned away. But I think she recognized that if she didn't turn them away and something happened, that she could be closed until December and probably permanently closed. So it really sounds like the community is rallying around Taking a taking that safe approach, um, like you, like you mentioned, stay safe to stay open. Yeah, there's really no option. Uh, you know, we have to we have to protect our people. We have to protect our businesses. And I think um, you know all of our marketing that's going out right now. It's not necessarily come up and hike and bike and fish and golf. It's really hey, when you come up, please follow these guidelines. And this is what we expect of you. And this is what's available to you. Like Karen said, it's not business as usual. It's not uh, every every restaurant is not at capacity. And I think the, the, the biggest challenge that we have is right now, uh, you know, sitting here today, it's 75 degrees and sunny and gorgeous. And the town has allowed restaurants to spill out off of their patios into parking spaces, et cetera. Um, but once we hit September uh, and definitely October, that outdoor dining kind of goes away. So right now, businesses relying on um, people coming in have a little bit more capacity. But as we get to winter, and patios and extra spaces go away. Uh, that takeout message is going to be extremely critical to keep people in business because restaurants are in a lowest margin. They could be at, you know, single digit margins on profit. So um, we really need to push to, to, to stay safe, to stay open for the next two months and, and make as much um, money as we can right now. 
So how have you, you mentioned that you have a, a very um, small hospital system and how have you been working with health officials as well as the government to uh, not only mitigate any sort of outbreak, but plan for if unfortunately something like that were to happen? Yeah, we've been very flexible. Like I said, when we when we first went into this, um, my board, we met on March 16th. So we had uh, the ski area closed over the weekend. We met on Monday, March 16th and decided that it was in the industry and the community's best interest for us to discourage visitation. You know, again, most difficult decision we've had to make. Um, and it was something that we felt that we just couldn't uh, address the issues with people coming to town and having our hospital get overrun. Uh, since then, our hospital has the capacity now for 40 beds, uh, and I think we're up to about seven or eight ventilators. So, you know, they've, they've accommodated and they built on that, but at the time, back in March, we didn't have that uh, capability. So we work very closely with the town, we work very closely with the public health office to make sure that whatever the messaging is, that we're getting that out. You know, we're not setting any policy ourselves as the Tourism Bureau. Um, but once they say that we have uh, a certain number of people that are limited at X, we promote the fact that this is what you're going to expect when you get here. A lot of it is setting expectations for people, you know, and, and, and I think Karen mentioned it too. I think the, the hardest part is what we went out in March and discouraged people from coming up here. And now we're trying to encourage them to come back responsibly. And there's a, there's a little bit of blowback from people saying, well, now you want us to come back. It's like, yeah, you know, we're, we're better prepared for you. We have better hospital uh, capabilities and uh, you know we feel that hiking, biking, fishing, golf, even when we get back to skiing with the exception of places like gondolas or maybe uh, uh, cafeterias, they're all naturally socially distanced activities. You know when you're out hiking it's easy enough I'll go out with my kids and if we see somebody coming we step six feet off the trail let them pass and, and uh, move forward. Uh, we've also been out promoting the you know the, the, the fact that we just want people to be responsible wearing masks etc and you know, again, we've had some feedback on that. Uh, our, our marketing campaign at visitmammoth.com, we've, we've put masks on all of our uh, mythical creatures and really just tried to get people to understand that, that um, you know, it's just a common courtesy. It's not, it, it's not you know, it, it's nothing that's going to take away from your experience. The mountains are still the mountains. And do you find that most visitors are respecting those, those rules and following um following the protocols that have been put in place and, and they're just happy to be in a gorgeous destination like Mammoth? Yeah, I think they are. I think that, I think that for the most part, people respect that. I think you'll see the odd person who is either um, defiant to it or just doesn't, uh, just forgets. Uh, I was in the supermarket last night, probably about nine o'clock, and I would say that 90% of the people in there were, were following the protocols. So, you know, it's, it's um, I think people understand the whole stay safe to stay open piece is is important because if we get that that spike we're in deep trouble because once we hit labor day uh, between labor day and really call it christmas it's pretty slow around here just like a lot of places and while we've built those uh those time frames up in good years in a bad year i don't want to see what happens to us all right. Well, we are just uh, about time. So I'm going to bid you farewell for now and uh, we'll see you back for Q&A. Thanks so much, John. Great. Thank you. And <clears throat> Andrew. <clears throat> All Hello. right. So uh, welcome, Andrew. Andrew is the uh, president of Blue Mountain Village Association in uh, Ontario, Canada. So can you let us know kind of what the the process to reopen looked like at Blue Mountain? Well, our, uh, our experience was, was quite similar to those who have spoke prior in that uh, mid-March, our, um, our resort and, and partner and member businesses pretty much closed overnight. Um, and uh, we had a, have experienced a staged reopening that has been dictated by the Ontario government and working closely with the public health authority. So that, that uh, around the same timelines as with in fact in, in May, some things started to open up and then we were able to uh, um, effectively market toward the end of June and really start um, marketing for overnight visitors again. Um, in between there, uh, retail stores were permitted to open uh, for um, 
curbside pickup and and uh, stuff like that. So now we're we're at a point now where pretty much all of the operations are are operational, although in in quite an adaptive form uh, on all fronts. So uh, you know, for us, we followed a very similar process in that we you know convened our members and stakeholders on a weekly basis to to really get a lay of the land, understand the the, the needs of public health, and and assess the market. Um, you know. I won't repeat what's been said already in terms of some of the processes, but some things that we did uh, in addition to some of the things that we've already we, we've already heard, we took the lead as an organization to develop reopening standards and guidelines for our members, so retail stores, restaurateurs, um, et cetera, and uh, took the lead in working with public health to really create the, re the reopening uh, resources with all of the right public health information. And then we created a, a business management process where businesses could audit their operation and actually use a planning toolkit to get ready uh, for their operations. And then uh, we even created a, a self-assessment tool so that our operators, as they started to reopen, could go and check in on their operations and, and tweak as possible. So that was very helpful. And, and we leveraged that within our destination at Blue Mountain, but we also partnered with our neighboring municipalities and made those resources available for our neighbor towns. Because, um, you know, the South Georgian Bay region where Blue Mountain is located, you know, we are a, a constellation of destinations and uh, we're as strong as all of our partners. So we really worked together on that front. Um, one of the other things that uh, we worked on as we were planning for the reopening was we wanted to make sure that we maintained our relationship with our visitors and guests while they were not permitted to come. So we created a Dream Today, Visit Tomorrow um, campaign where we provided uh, village experiences online for about a, a 14 week period uh, just to continue to connect with our core customers. So the village association, much like uh, Tourism Whistler, uh, Mont Tremblant and others, you know, we do a lot of um, uh, events, uh, concerts, programming, a lot of family activities. So we, we offered a lot of online programming to, you know, um, really help families who were at home, many working from home and trying to entertain their kids. So we just reached out and we had uh, different uh, performances. We had a, a, a concert with um, a, a Canadian ki a children's singer named Fred Penner, which drew 25,000 uh, audience across the world, actually. And uh, so we just, we did things that we were known for as a brand to connect with our, our customers and locals while we were shut down. And we found that it was a really great way to uh, stay connected. Our, all of our social channels and um, numbers and engagement scores actually grew during the shutdown. So which has actually allowed us a bigger market to market to now that we're, we have reopened. So that was, uh, that was great. One of the other key things for us was was recruiting and really conceptualizing an, an entirely new um, role on our, our resort community, and that is an ambassador team. So this ambassador team is a, is a number of employees whose job it is to, to assist with the flow of guests from, from uh, arrival, navigation through to the village, to uh, restaurants, retail shops, and over to attractions, and to be there to answer questions to um, assess unsafe behaviors and address them uh, in a one-on-one -on -one fashion and to direct people accordingly to their, their end point. So a, uh, a little bit of a guest services, a little bit of risk management uh, and a little bit of crowd management as well. So we have a team in place in the event that we have surges or we need to you know, um, execute some crowd control. We have a, a whole new team who can do that. And uh, we, we created that concept within our our resort environment, but we're also working with a local municipality to deploy that team at local beaches and other neighboring downtowns so that we're doing that uh, in a collective fashion. So, so like, like many others, a lot of uh, community collaboration and uh, really just bringing people together on a weekly basis. And, um, you know, the, the, one of the best parts of, of this adaptation is that we are, we are sharing real time sales data and insights now in a way that we didn't do as often pre-COVID-19. So one of, the, one of the silver linings is that we're we are all a lot more dialed in on the data. Uh, and, you know, a lot of our operators are, are better able to plan their human resources and scheduling because we have a better handle on what's coming. Um, 
and then um, you know really promoting a message of plan ahead, book early, make your reservations before you arrive is helping us to do that as well. Uh, um, there's so many great takeaways in, in what you just went through for our audience. I want to go back to the uh, virtual and the, the digital kind of community yeah. events that, that you put forth. Is that something that you envision you'll keep up with, uh, you know, once things go yeah. back to new normal? How, like how, do you have any numbers on how many um, new, you, you know, travelers you were able to engage with? Via, yeah. Oh yeah, so we, we engage with more than 50,000 different people through the, through the program and the campaign. And our, um, our numbers grew by about a 15% in terms of subscribership across our, our social platforms. So pretty big numbers. Um, and it, I would put this in the category of, of uh, you know, old paradigm, new paradigm. So in the past, we would, we would not have live broadcast a lot of our festivals and events. And the whole idea was, of course, that content and programming is there, especially for our, our, uh, our visitors who were coming uh, to stay on resort. But one of the things that we've learned is that, you know, we have all this great content that we host every day in a live environment. And rather than keeping that content reserved just for an in-person experience, we can leverage it for better marketing and better engagement um, and so cross marketing and, and uh, opportunities like that. So we will definitely bring the learnings forward. I can see us uh, executing a bit of a hybrid performance in the future. When we have a, a very strong um, performer, uh, we may very well broadcast some of it live. And then on, on the flip side, we are also learning that um, in this era where capacity is such a premium mm -hmm. and, um, and we don't have the space we used to, we're also looking at when we're available to creating sort of bespoke experiences that will be for a much smaller audience, but will be for folks who actually uh, uh, plan ahead. So if you book ahead and you make a reservation and you book a longer term stay, you have access to that VIP content. So we're looking at our programming in a different way. Um, you know, we were talking early in our pre-tar trail where uh, people hike up our, our mountain trails and they experience performers throughout, throughout the day on the trails. So rather than doing that in an event format, what we're looking at doing is, is actually executing that, uh, that concept um, periodically throughout the summer just to add a surprise and delight for hikers. So the idea is we'll take the best learnings from our festivals, but actually apply it to operations and product development and figure out how to create an added value there so we can sell more hiking passes or accommodation passes, et cetera. So, you know, really slicing and dicing what we do and finding new ways for it to be relevant. I love that the type A person in me loves what you said about getting getting the VIP uh, access for, for planning ahead. So would you say, how would you say your marketing efforts have shifted um, as a result of, of the situation? Are you, you know, reaching out and trying to engage that new audience that you've gathered or are you focusing more on your core repeat business? Yeah, I would say for us, uh, a big part of our marketing is, is re it's not about pivoting to a new demographic. It's really allowing us to focus on our, our core demographic and making sure our families, who's, who's our core market, uh, and uh, predominantly in the Southern Ontario region, um, really making sure that we are creating um, an experience that is for them. And, and you know, because we have a limited capacity, we can't be all things to all people and just rely on uh, streams of traffic. We really need to um, you know, curate our offerings for that market. So our, our marketing has been much more focused and, um, and, a, and a lot of our messaging is around safety and around plan ahead, book ahead. And, and um, you know, the concept of being rewarded for booking ahead and planning ahead. So folks who make reservations in advance are gonna have premium parking spots. People who purchase um, uh, um, all day, play all day passes for attractions are gonna have priority access to those attractions versus folks who may drive up for the day and, and see what they can get. So one of the, one of the challenges we have 
it's a challenge and, and it's, it's a blessing at the same time because we have a lot of day visitation, much like Whistler moving from a weekend destination to, to, um, to uh, trying to encourage longer stays. We are trying to distance the, the day trip that's unplanned because uh, we, so, you know, we're using subtle messaging in order to, uh, to do that. And it's really about incentivizing people who plan ahead. Great. Well, again, uh, I think you offered a ton of takeaways and ideas. I'm really impressed by how uh, creative that, that your, your team has been with uh, what you've put forth. So um, we're at time. So I am going to say goodbye to you for now as well. Great. And, Thank you. Uh, really appreciate all the insight. And uh, next, I am going to welcome Bruno Hugler uh, from Cron Montana Tourism in Congress. And Bruno is coming to us it's, uh, in Switzerland, and he's ending his day with us. So welcome, Bruno. Yes, hello to all of you, and uh, good evening. Uh, it's a big pleasure, and I send my best regard here from, from Switzerland, from the, from the Swiss Alps, uh, from Cron Montana. So, so Bruno, tell us a little bit about what happened in Crom Montana and then the current state of, of what the destination um, is, is in and, and what's open and, and where you stand. Yeah, um, this pleasure. So it was uh, like for, us, for all of us, a uh, really unexpected situation in, in February, March. Uh, we were living, we were just passing a, just a great season. We had uh, great numbers, we had uh, great snow conditions and uh, we just could also organize the uh, Alpine Ski World Cup uh, winds downhill and some races. So we had, uh, we had a great winter until we had then to, uh, to lockdown um, uh, also, uh, also in March. It was really at the beginning of March when we had the first signs that it was getting close to Italy. And then we had to cancel the first event. So we were really concerned about that and we had the first event is more than 1,000 people, which were, uh, was not allowed um, uh, anymore. And then, uh, of course, we were entering into a very specific uh, period because the first time in my life I had to tell to our uh, loved visitors, valued visitors, please stay at home. But uh, on the other hand, we didn't want us, traveling was still allowed. It was just an advice, stay at home. But uh, traveling was possible, the resort, was uh, was was open so you could uh, you were able to come to Kramontana to bike and to hike and to, to to walk around of course all the activities all the services all the infrastructures was uh, was closed from uh, mid of march but the resort was in a way always open and we had quite a lot of visitors coming and this was a little bit this challenge uh, the, the balance between okay stay at home but you are anyway, you are welcome because our valued second home owners, we didn't want to, to tell them, okay, now you have to stay at home. Uh, but this was a quite a, a difficult uh, period, but I think we managed it quite well. And, um, and we had a lot uh, also of visitors, especially from Italy. They took advantage and they just stayed from their February holiday. They just added uh, another period to stay in their property here in uh, uh, in Carmontano. So our, our role changed also in a way that uh, instead of, uh, of talking, uh, say, come and visit Carmontano, we were more oriented in giving uh, helpful information to our partners. So we changed from one day to the other, um, also on our website. We were explaining what is open. So all the um, uh, the medical services, all the food and uh, the shops, etc., were open. A lot of restaurants were proposing also takeaway, home delivery, and this was very much appreciated. We also um, edited a weekly newsletter with the latest information, and we gave also advice how to how to do how to handle this very specific sit uh, situation. We had also from the 16th of. Uh, of March, we had to close our tourist information, but we were available seven days a week uh, by uh, by the social media, by the um, by phone, and this was also very much appreciated. But we couldn't uh, welcome uh, physically our our guests in the in the tourist office. We had 
uh, home office, of course. We already started in February to make everything happen, to, um, that our stuff could work uh, from, from uh, at home. And this was then a, a, big, a big value from, uh, for us. So this was the, the past. This was really a very difficult situation. Let's talk about the present situation. Yeah. And this is very encouraging. We are open. You can say almost everything is, is open, is accessible. Uh, you, you can go up to the mountain, you can play golf, you can come and visit us in the, in the tourist office, you can go to the restaurants. Of course, we have a certain number of, uh, of restrictions that, that apply in restaurants, but it's not that heavy. heavy. So you have, a, for instance, to give uh, one contact if you are more than four people uh, on a table in a restaurant. So in case uh, they could contact you, uh, and, and follow and follow up, but uh, we, we we are really happy and uh, to to welcome again um, a very interesting number of uh, of visitors. Also, bookings are coming more and more. We have a lot of summer camps for food, uh, football for um, for other activities, also golf introduction for all the families, and this is working uh, very well. So people are looking for something uh, also very special here uh, here in Komotana. And we have quite uh, good numbers um, of reservation. As you know, that Cromontana, uh, we have a lot of um, of second home owners, and this will also make the difference. I guess and I believe that a lot of these uh, owners they will remember that they have a property here in Cromontana and that they will take advantage and, uh, and 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 visit us. So we are again on the way to to really uh, after saying okay stay at home we changed this already a couple of weeks ago and say okay come and it's up to us to make this resort safe and clean we also created on a national uh, based uh, a label we promote this and we also say okay we do everything to protect and to apply uh, the concept uh, given by the by the federal government or by the canton so I, I think, Bruno, there's a lot of optimism with what you're saying um, as far as what's, you know, what the state of things are in Cron Montana um, versus in, uh, in North America and, the, and the, you know, the U.S. and Canada. So it's great to hear that, that you guys are open to such a, a, a large capacity. Um, you mentioned that you have a lot of visitors from Italy. And you know, I know that was originally one of the hot spots of coronavirus. How are you handling travelers, uh, international travelers, and um, how how the locals feel about welcoming international travelers to Cromontana? There were some fears about uh, the Italians are they are coming now in mass and uh, and it will our medical. Uh... Uh, healthcare will be uh, will be uh, big enough to welcome all that, but it was uh, really uh, managed very very well. And I think at the moment there are no fears at this uh, at this at this point. So we have mostly uh, visitors from from Switzerland. The, the the large majority is coming from from Switzerland, but now as borders uh, are, are open again so we also are welcoming uh, especially from uh, from our neighboring uh, countries france germany italy and a little bit from austria uh, but this is not this is uh, this is um, the smaller the smaller part the big ma majority is coming uh, from switzerland and i think uh, uh, the, 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 this fear has gone and uh, we are very happy to welcome uh, them we have restrictions in regards to events until the 31st of August, uh, all uh, events with more than 1,000 people are forbidden. Uh, but we can do up to 1,000, and we are focusing on, on, on some smaller events up to, to 300. This is a good size to handle because we have some restrictions. You have to take all the, 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 the contact details of the participants. But we are willing to really uh, uh, propose a, a, a program with different activities. Uh, and we do, for instance, one uh, great concert, classical concert uh, on the golf course, on our famous, uh, famous golf course, with up to 300 persons. So this would be just a great experience. That, that's, that's a size that we can handle mm -hmm. and we can also guarantee that we respect all the, the, the concept and uh, the rules that we have to apply. 
I think that's a really good point that you're making there, that even though you're allowed to welcome a group of up to a thousand people, you're you know, only welcoming a group of, of 300 because that's more manageable for the destination and the space that you have available. That's um, you know, a very, very smart move. Um, I've, I've got another question. Uh, I, I've also, I'd just like to say that it's exciting to hear you're having a larger event. Um, too, because I know that that's something that uh, that we're struggling with over here in, in the US. Um, but uh, would you say you mentioned that you have a large majority of your travelers are from Switzerland? Would you say that's that's typically what you see, or are you seeing more uh, you know Switzerland residents than than you typically see in Crown Montana? We we already have before about uh, two thirds of our visitors are coming from Switzerland. And now we lost definitely a part. Of, we lost all uh, overseas business, and we lost also part from from Europe. And uh, of course, even if you are focusing now a little bit more on Switzerland, and even here on the on the, on the close region, because people also may be living uh, thirty kilometers away, they they love to just change a little bit the place and come for a weekend here to uh, to Kramatana, spend a good time. So our um, uh, midterm and long term strategy will not change. So we we will come back to the markets and also to, uh, to, to North America, of course, because we, we, we want to, uh, to, to keep this diversity also of our, uh, of our clientele. So one, one event we have to cancel, which is really uh, very, very sad, was the, uh, the, the Omega European Masters Golf. This, this great event um, with about 50,000 visitors every year. That's the event, the most important we had, we had to cancel, but we, uh, we think in the future we want to bring this back to the program 21. Great. Well, um, again, Bruno, your, your time is up just like our other speakers. So I appreciate you uh, sharing what's, what's happening in Switzerland. And like I said already, uh, it's very hopeful. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome Andrew, John, and Karen back. Uh, up and we'll now begin our Q&A portion. So for our audience, just uh, submit any sort of questions that you have through the Q&A. You can either have, you know, just general questions or a question for one of our specific um, presenters. I, I want to kick this off though with uh, Bruno mentioned events and being able to hold events. Um, I know in the US and Canada, we haven't been as successful. Um, what are some of the things that you guys have, have tried to do and tried to propose uh, for being able to hold events in your destination? I know, Karen, you said it's just, it's not possible for anything over 50 until phase four, which is with a vaccine. So I guess you're kind of out for this question. <laughs> we haven't tried. <laughs> um, but Andrew or, or John, has, has there been anything that you've, uh, effort that you put forth. Yeah, you know, we, we tried to um, propose a, a way to run our, our annual half marathon where the organizers had proposed doing 50 person starts over a 48 hour period so that there were, uh, there was, there was more um, separation. And unfortunately that was still, when, when that was being proposed back in May, it was still fairly early on. So it wasn't very well accepted. I know that we've seen some of our neighboring states. I know Moab has had an event, Bryce Canyon has an event this weekend where it's set up very similar, where it's interesting if you want to start time between uh, noon and 8 p.m., it's X dollar. And then if you want uh, a time after that, it's, it's, it's less expensive. So if you want to run in the middle of the night, it's less expensive. But um, we, were, we were not granted that, I think because it was early on and because they still needed a month or so to alert the participants. You know, but being able to try and figure out how to get 2,000 half marathoners through over the course of 48 hours, it, it's a good concept. I think it is probably where we're headed. It just was too early for the for the board to approve that. Um, and and we've got a follow up question for you, Andrew, to elaborate a little bit on what you're doing with your prop pop up performances along the trails uh, versus having music festivals. I know that that's a big deal in Mountain Town. Yeah, so we have a couple of ideas underway. So um, uh, our guitar trail, which I mentioned before, was a was a morning of hiking where we would have artists performing um, 
in the forest. So you'd hike a hundred meters or so, stop, there'd be a, a, a guitarist and a, and a singer. Um, uh, and then you would keep hiking and, and keep moving. And then it would all culminate with a big concert at the end of the day or the end of the afternoon. So what, what we're looking at doing now is just having uh, performers periodically uh, along the trail. Um, we are permitted to have a musician <clears throat> perform, but not sing. So once they sing, that's when you, you, you are attracting a crowd. But if we just have someone creating some ambiance, then that's okay. So we're looking at having uh, different artists uh, in, in creative spaces. So think on a hiking trail or think, um, you know, uh, seated atop of uh, one of the guest room balconies playing for the crowds below and the, the streetscapes, that, that sort of thing. So uh, those are some examples. I'll give you another example. Our destination, um, we have a, a fair number of grab and go businesses. So you can pick up some, you know, great Canadian poutine, or you can pick up, uh, you know, a coffee, uh, uh, you know, uh, burgers to go, but we don't have a lot of outdoor seating for those, for, for that, uh, for that purpose. So we've actually converted an open space zone to uh, a seating for grab and go customers, a seating area. And we've actually decorated it with uh, sort of like nice Edison bulbs and we've got protocols in place and, and it's all uh, safely, um, the seating is distributed. We've created a small stage there where we can have some artists perform. Again, not sing, just, just play instruments. <clears throat> so we've taken something that, you know, could be described as a, an outdoor cafeteria and turned it into a, a charming experience for people who are buying a, a grab and go food item. So it's just a way to take, uh, um, to take, um, create an experience for customers who might be lost based in this new dynamic in terms of where they are and, and give them a creative experience. So more things like that to come. Great. Thanks so much yeah. for elaborating on that. Uh, our next question is how do you guys see the winter season differing from what you're seeing now in uh, the summer season and what, you know, what capacity do you envision the resorts being able to operate at? You know, I think that's a question specifically for the resorts, but I think one of the things that we're keeping an eye on is what's happening in the Southern Hemisphere right now with the resorts down there and with the towns down there as to what they're, what they're um, handling. Are they taking reservations for skiing? Are they limiting the amount of people? Um, because I think that that's going to be either a success story or a lesson to be learned in what's happening in Australia, New Zealand, um, South America. So I think that uh, we need to be paying attention to that. I think the capacity for the winters, as I mentioned, even just here in town, the restaurants that are able to have patios and be able to even move into their parking lots, that's gonna go away once we get cold weather. So I think the capacity is gonna be a challenge and in places like restaurants, again, where they're looking at single digit profit margins uh, and they're going back into a facility inside where they may only have 40, 50, maybe 60% capacity, uh, but their rent's going to be the same cost. I'm not sure how everyone's going to survive on that. So that's a, that's a big, scary one. One of the things that we've um, sort of tossed around is we've, we can't host meetings, so we've got empty meeting space. So can we repurpose that into some sort of restaurant facility, feeding um, more people and bring the restaurants in to do that sort of thing? So just starting on that one. <laughs> That's definitely a great point. Yeah, those yeah. ball those ballrooms can mm -hmm. certainly be repurposed. Yeah. Um, so another question here is uh, again mentions you know a little bit more on the resort uh, side, but what's the DMO perspective like as far as season pass holders versus new customers, and and where do you guys kind of weigh in on that? Well, I'll, I'll jump in and and start. I think. Um, you know, what we talked about was is making sure that our uh, very um, precious capacity is earmarked for uh, our most uh, um, loyal customers. So for pass holders, the idea is how do we make sure that pass holders are getting and that they have the, the least barriers to enjoy their experience. So making sure the pass holders feel the love in terms of added services and value is, is at the end of the day, the priority. So considering those being the, the VIPs, anybody else? Want exactly. to add? I could say from my side, so okay, we have the season pass holders, of course, they, uh, 
we have quite a lot of them. Uh, it also uh, comes from the, the big number of uh, second home uh, owners, but I don't. Uh, I think the capacity will be a challenge definitely for this winter. But as we are quite a, a big area by a large, a large destination, I don't worry too much about the, the, the capacity that we can that we can offer. So we have a, we have a lot of space. And uh, it's up to us now to follow all the rules and to keep the, the numbers low. And then uh, I'm very positive also for the for the coming uh, for the coming winter season. But all depends now a little bit to, to us. We are preparing already. We are also planning this with speaker events. Uh, again, we uh, we are holding a ski world cup in, in January. The International Ski Federation decided to to maintain also the world championships in uh, in Cortina in Italy, which is close by also. So we are quite confident and uh, we hope to have a great, uh, a great winter season, definitely with some restrictions, also up to the mountain, but it's, we have now a little bit of time to, to think about also to, uh, to handle this, uh, the, this number of, of, of people and to, to give enough space to each, to each visitor. So as I said before, for us it's important to, to, to promote a clean and safe uh, resort and to do everything for the comfort and the safety for our clients. Yep, I think I saw everyone nodding their heads there with what you were saying, Bruno, that, that safety is is paramount here. Um, John, I, did I see you raise your hand? To yeah, I think, I think the, when we're talking about season pass holders versus new customers, I think all of our intent to travel studies have said that people wanna go where they're familiar with, uh, where they feel safe and, and between second homeowners, season pass holders, there are stakeholders that know the restaurants, that know the people in the restaurants that want to support them. So, you know, once we get into the winter and we start looking at, at pass holders and second homeowners and loyal uh, visitors, that's, they're the people that are going to be going out and, and supporting the restaurants from a takeout standpoint. And, and really, I think that they, they know the market, they know what's here, they know who they're taking care of. And so I think they're, they're more valuable than ever before. Mm -hmm. I, I also think just to my... Um... My example about the grab and go customer and the elevated experience, there are still ways that you can create a special experience for, for different cohorts of customers so that you, you can continue to earn their loyalty over time. Um, so I think you kind of have to do both, but obviously pass holders in a, in a ski context are, are critically important. But I think there's, there are ways to show value to even smaller yield customers. Um, that, that will help you in the long run as well. You have, to, you have to manage both at the end of the day. True, very true. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we are just about at time, so I'm gonna uh, wrap it up for our, our Q&A and just say thank you again to all of you for joining us today and the larger uh, MTS community. It's uh, been very, very great to have you guys here and hopefully really valuable, lots of creative ideas and some takeaways for our group. So. Uh, with that, I will um, just want to share our um, next webinar. We will be doing a similar format uh, in two weeks on the 27th, and we'll be sitting down with the mountain resorts uh, and hearing their perspective on reopening and what the, the current state of affairs is. So um, make sure that you register for that at mountaintravel.com slash webinars. We really appreciate everyone joining us today. Uh, and uh, we will see you in two weeks. And thank you so much, guys. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.